Well, it's a glorious subject, brothers and sisters. God will save his people. And we sang, didn't we? For Zion's sake, I will not rest, saith God, nor hold my peace until Jerusalem be blessed and Judah's sorrows cease. And this is God's plan and purpose for the earth. It centres around the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and raising his brothers and sisters and gathering his brothers and sisters to him, making them immortal and endued with all power and understanding and wisdom that they might take control of this earth. And for his nation of Israel and for the Gentile nations, they will be educated in the ways of God and will reflect glory to God. And then the whole earth will be a wonderful paradise. And this is what we're longing for, isn't it, brothers and sisters? When man's sin that mars the earth will be taken away. And in the mercy of God, we may be there helping the Lord Jesus in establishing the kingdom and teaching the nations the right ways and bringing glory and blessing to God. Now, the subject of how all this is going to happen, uh, how the saints are going to be prepared at Sinai and how Israel is going to be saved, is a matter which isn't dealt with very much nowadays. And from the clarity that there was in the days of Brother Thomas and um, Brother Roberts to today, we've got a lot of confusion and conflicting ideas. And I'm hoping that with this rather detailed study, we shall come to find out the wonderful sequence that the Bible unfolds for those that seek his coming. So what we're going to deal with, first of all, is preparing the saints at Sinai. And it's a big subject and there'll be a lot of references on the slides. And uh, I know some of you take pictures, or I certainly do take pictures of the slides. And one of the problems is to know when the brother is going to change to another slide. You know, when is that slide full? So you'll notice in the bottom of this screen, uh, an inverted triangle. Uh, and when the screen fills to wherever the triangle is, that's when I'm about to change to another side slide. So I hope that helps. And also, God willing, the slides will be put up on the video we put up on the uh, Chris Delphine video site. So be able to watch it again. But if anybody wants copies of the slides, um, I'll put my email in at the end. Just send me an email and I'll happily share them with you. So what we're going to be looking at, just to give us some structure for our study today, we're going to look at an overall time frame in which we can hang together the various aspects of both the talks. And then in this first part, look at a more detailed time frame concerning the return of the Lord Jesus and when the judgment takes place and the Battle of Armageddon. Not that we can put dates to it, but it gives us a time frame. And then look at who, when, where we're going to be raised to judgment, questions that arise when we think of the judgment seat. And then practical things, you know, how are the living gathered to the judgment? Um, what is the basis for uh, being judged? What happens to the accepted and rejected? Um, one that concerns many families, you know, what about the young children of believers? And uh, we're going to take a look at the work for the saints at Sinai before ever the Lord Jesus is revealed to the nation of Israel. So let's just start off with uh, an overall time frame which covers more than we're going to be dealing with, but gives us a basis which we can, as it were, fit the pieces of the jigsaw too. So I've made three headings, one saints, matters concerning Israel, and matters concerning biblical nations, the nations that the Bible deals with. Uh, and the first, I believe, before ever Jesus is revealed to the nations is that he calls away the saints to judgment, it is the time of resurrection uh, for Israel. It will be the time that Ezekiel talks about, dwelling in peace and safety. And 
While the judgment takes place, there is the acceptance or rejection of the saints. And the Bible makes it clear there is a work before ever the Lord Jesus is revealed to the world, the Elijah work, paralleling with John the Baptist's work before Jesus was revealed to the nation of Israel, and a work of instructing the Arab nations, who, as we shall see, have a role to play in the kingdom. And then following that will be this invasion of Israel, what we call the Gogin invasion, based on Ezekiel chapter 38. And for Israel, devastating consequences, Jerusalem wrested from them, two thirds of the nation cut off. And when we think of the population of Israel today, that's a vast number. This is a Holocaust uh, repeating again. And that's the signal for Christ and the saints who are now immortalized to come up to save Israel, the march of the rainbow angel. And the Battle of Armageddon takes place, which destroys the enemies of Israel. Gog is defeated with all her companions. And to begin with, the kingdom is established in Israel. Um, meanwhile, there is a regrouping of the European nations in opposition to what is happening in Israel. And for the saints, they are the warriors, they are the preachers, they are the rulers who begin their work of calling the Jews scattered around the world back to their land. A time of great difficulty for Israel, scattered Israel, because there is going to be time of war and opposition in Europe. A time when, in the words of Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast is slain and the other three beasts have their power taken away. And step by step, nations submit themselves to the king in Zion until eventually all nations submit and then the kingdom is established worldwide. So that's the general time frame. I now want to look at a more specific time frame concerning the events surrounding the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I believe that the Lord Jesus comes back in secret to his household as say, the resurrection takes place. And then some time after that, there is the Gogian invasion when Israel is broken as a nation. And then some time after that is the Battle of Armageddon when Christ and the saints come and save Israel. And I'm going to suggest a 10 year period from Christ's return in secret to the household, to his revealing a mighty power at the Battle of Armageddon. That's based on Leviticus 23, and we'll look at that in a moment. And then the kingdom fully established, a time of warfare, especially in Europe. I would allocate a period of 40 years, which would make a jubilee period, so quite an appropriate uh, span from his return to the kingdom fully established and the millennial reign of a thousand years beginning, uh, a 50 year jubilee period to that commencement. And it is important that we have a good grasp on these things, because if we believe that we won't face judgment until after the Gogin invasion, then if that is not the case, if Christ comes back first before the Gogin invasion, then we'll be caught unawares. So it is important. So it hinges on an understanding of Leviticus chapter 23. So let's just turn to Leviticus and chapter 23, which is dealing with the feasts of Israel. And it comes to the seventh month, which is the final series of feasts for Israel. And get me a moment, chapter 23 of Leviticus. Uh, when we come to verse uh, 24, uh, we read of the instructions for this last period. So the, on the first day of the month, we read of in verse 24, on the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath. So this is a special Sabbath, um, a memorial of blowing of trumpets 
and holy convocation. Do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. So that was what Israel had to do. On the first of this seventh month, uh, there was this uh, blowing of trumpets, a special Sabbath, a gathering together of Israel, and an offering made by fire. And then that was followed, verse 27, on the 10th day of the month was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the most solemn day in Israel's assembly, when they again had to gather together, no work, a holy gathering, and there was various ceremonies, the um, offerings that had to be made on that day, a special Sabbath day for them. And then following that special period of the 10th day of the month, on the 15th day of the month, began the eighth day festival of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sokoth. Again, special Sabbaths on the beginning and the last days, and the whole period was for them to dwell in booths. So let's see how we can draw out from that a time frame for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we look at the first day, this memorial of blowing of trumpets. Now, at the beginning of every month, a trumpet was blown. But it's clear from the detail that is given to us that this is more than just a trumpet blast to announce the beginning of the month. This was a continuous blowing. So this was something special. And of course, that reminds us of Paul's words in Corinthians that the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. And I think this is quite appropriate to think that this is a pointer to the resurrection of the saints and a holy convocation, the gathering of the dead and living saints, I believe at Sinai, will be the biggest convocation, the biggest gathering there of believers there has ever been. And it will be a time of preparation, a time of dedication, an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And that indeed is so applicable to the bestowing of everlasting life upon the faithful saints. So I believe here we have in the events of the first day of the seventh month, uh, a figure of the gathering of the believers together uh, and their change to immortality. And then in the sequence of events was this very special day, the Day of Atonement, when the sins of Israel were remembered again and atoned for. They were covered. The scapegoat bore them away. And to me, it is appropriate as a symbol, a figure of the redemption of Israel. The Messiah who came to bear away their sins uh, comes back to save them. Uh, and they enter into the new covenant, uh, offering made by fire, the ram without blemish. Now, if we apply a day for a year, then that gives us a 10 year period between the first event and the second event. And then four days later, they were preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles, the 15th day. This was a week's Bible school, a week plus eight days, where they could concentrate on the blessings of God. Uh, and I believe that we have to um, see in this a preparation for that day of rest that Paul talks about in Hebrews, when the Sabbath day of rest will dawn. Now, we have to use a different time scale here. We have Four days later, when they then prepare for this keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles with a special Sabbath of rest. And I believe we have to apply not a day for a year, but a day for 10 years. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles lasted for eight days. Now, to fit the figure, it would have to last a thousand days 
or if we have this multiplication of a year for 10 years, uh, we'd have to last 100 days. Well, that, that's impossible, isn't it, for a feast to be kept that long? Wouldn't be practical for Israel. So God uses a saint day. An eighth day is a cycle of a week and a day beyond, that which be li- lies beyond the Sabbath of rest. And there's a wonderful point of forward to the coming kingdom. So I, I believe that if we just map this out, we have the Feast of Tabernacle Trumpets on the first day, the Day of Atonement on the 10th day, the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day, and the feast ends on the 22nd of the month, eight days later. And then there is a solemn assembly uh, following that. Then there's a wonderful prefiguration, the return to the household, the battle of Armageddon and the salvation of Israel, the Day of Atonement for them, the Gogin invasion having taken place some time before that. And then the kingdom fully established, uh, the uh, marking the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles and the celebration of the kingdom um, the, in, prefigured in the eight-day festival. And then followed that a solemn assembly when at the end of the millennium, the second resurrection and all will be immortal. Uh, and again, a wonderful gathering of saints from the first resurrection, saints from the second resurrection, and God will be all in all, and God's plan and purpose will be completed with the earth. So a 10-year period there, I believe, and a 40-year period there to the kingdom fully established. Now, I can't be dogmatic on that, but it does seem to fit. So a busy period of 10 years, I believe, while the saints are being prepared, Jesus is hidden from the world. And so the first knowledge of Jesus' return will be the resurrection, the anastasis, the standing up again. And Brother Thomas written a booklet on anastasis, um, the standing up again, a three-stage process, uh, a seed body, he describes it, a sprout body, and a raised body. And he takes 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the cycle that the Apostle Paul uses of sprouting and growing and bearing fruit, not to represent our bodies being planted in the dust of the grave when we die, but the whole lot is a prefiguration of this process of anastasis, the change from a mortal body, the dead are raised in mortality, they are tried, and they are then changed to immortality, uh, and that is this process. And Daniel chapter 10 is a fascinating chapter, I haven't time to look at it, but it indicates to us that this process of resurrection is something which doesn't take place in just a short period, it's uh, quite a process. Uh, And when we think of it, that in Bible times, then the Bible resurrections are are people who've been dead either that day or Lazarus, uh, four days dead, the Lord Jesus, three days dead. What we're looking at is people who've disappeared into dust millennia ago. And so it is a different process than that when the miracles that Jesus performed uh, and happened in Old Testament time miracles. This will be the first time since Eden that from dust of the earth will be recreated human beings. But unlike Adam, this was his first existence. These will be men and women who have existed in the past, brought to life again, because God has stored in his memory their DNA, uh, so that their bodies can be recreated to be like they were. And their memory is stored in God's memory bank, re-implanted into those minds, so that the minds of the believers will be as they were when they died. So uh, a wonderful process. And God has 
is so wonderful in how he works these things. Now, obviously, there are problems. My mother died of Alzheimer's and knowing nothing. And it was clear that her mind would have to be unwound, as it were, until she was at a position of before she was so confused. And we have to say how thankful we are. It's all in God's hands, not our hands. And so believers long dead, raised to life, recreated from the dust of the earth, I believe, uh, will be able to stand for judgment. And the final stages of resurrection, the change to an immortal body, can take place. So let's fill out those details. It's clear that uh, judgment begins at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And I believe this is hinting to us that there is a sequence of judgments. One, there is the judgment of the household. Um, we shall all appear, stand before him. But then there are the sinners, and that covers the nation of Israel, who are astray from God and have to, through the events that are going to unfold before them, will have a change of heart and change them to be accepted before God. And the sinners, the Gentiles, they too have to face their uh, judgment. God's going to have a series of outpouring of judgments, first upon the household, which I believe will be at Sinai, and we'll look at that in a moment. For Israel, it will be in the land. For those who are scattered from the land, their judgment will be uh, as they fight to get out and return to Israel. And I believe, and we shall see, that they'll be brought back via Sinai before being allowed to go into the land. For the Gentiles, those Gentile nations who have invaded Israel, well, their judgment will be in Israel itself, in the land, as they are destroyed. Um, but for the other nations, especially Europe, who resists, as we shall see, then their judgment will take place in Europe itself. So these are passages. Um, we're going to look at uh, those passages for Sinai. Uh, many references that tell us that Israel is going to be invaded and destroyed as a nation, um, a reaping of the harvest, as it were. And then for the Gentiles, we have the references in Revelation of Armageddon, the sheaves being threshed, which Joel picks up in Revelation uh, 17 uh, and 18 and 19, give us the greater details. So. There is much confusion about where the judgment is going to take place. Some say it's going to take place at Jerusalem, but if the judgment in my sequence is correct, then uh, Jerusalem is going to be invaded by an enemy of Israel. So that does make sense. Sinai makes sense. So let's have a look and see, you know, Let's look, ask a few questions. When does it how, take place? Where does it take place? Who are the responsible for judgment? Where will the judge be raised for judgment? How are the living called? How will we be judged? What happens to the rejected? What happens to the accepted? What about young children? So you can see it is a very extensive subject uh, for us. So let's uh, push on. So is the judgment before the Gogian invasion or is it after the Gogian invasion? I believe this is a very important matter because if it's before the Gogian invasion, then it can happen at any time. If it's after the Gogian invasion, then we shall know when it's going to happen because we will see it. And I believe all the evidence is it is before the Gogian invasion. And in fact, it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who really nails this, because in describing in Revelation chapter 16 of how the nations are prepared to be gathered to Armageddon, which is described in verse 14, how these frog spirits uh, gather the nations to the great battle of God Almighty, 
and then the Lord Jesus himself, he is the he that gathers them uh, to the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It is between those verses that we have the return of the, of the Lord Jesus and the resurrection and the gathering of the saints. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So the Lord Jesus himself has made it clear that the, his coming back is to the household as a thief. Uh, that there is judgment on the household. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus has got to come with saviors to rescue Israel. They have to be prepared beforehand. That's what the resurrection and the judgment is all about. The preparation of a body of people who can come and save God's people in their hour of greatest trial. And so I believe our historical understanding of these things has stood the test of time. And Sinai is the most fitting place because this is where Israel became God's people, God, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And I believe this is a fitting place for spiritual Israel to become his kings and his priests. And remember that Israel became a kingdom of priests 40 years before they entered into their inheritance. So for the saints, they will become his nation, his people, his special people, before they receive their inheritance, their allotment in the tribal allotments in the kingdom age. So these are the three passages which tell us that, or points to the fact that Sinai is the place for judgment. So let's have a look at these three passages. So turn with me, if we're in Leviticus, just go back to, oh, go onwards, sorry, going the wrong way, to Deuteronomy chapter 33, that wonderful song, a blessing that Moses deals with the history and the for future for Israel. And he paints this picture at the beginning in verses two and three of Yahweh coming from Sinai, rise, rising up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went forth a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints were in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. Now, that wasn't a situation that occurred in the past. Israel rejected God's word. They perished in the wilderness, didn't they? Uh, and if it was referring to the past, then surely the song would have some reference to the Passover, to the Exodus, to the crossing of the Red Sea. But it doesn't. Moses is looking to the future. This is a blessing on the tribes which seem to be set in the future. And towards the end in verse 27, it speaks of the eternal God is thy refuge underneath of the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Now, God did destroy Israel's enemies. But the language here is quite unusual. It's the only uh, place that it's been translated, the word has been translated eternal. It's the word that's normally translated east. The word God is Elohim. So we can translate that, the mighty ones of the east, thy refuge. Now that, of course, is picked up in Revelation chapter 16, very relevant, the chapter that deals with this time period, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So this is looking to the future when the way of the kings of the east uh, and the mighty ones of the east are going to be Israel's refuge because they're going to come and save Israel in their distress. Uh, and the uh, everlasting arms, or the arms of the Olam, Young's literal translation, beneath the uh, arms age during, age lasting, here are being prepared the ones who are going to take Israel and enfold them in their arms and save them their hour of need and care for them throughout the millennial age. A wonderful picture, but it starts with... Uh, God coming from Sinai to save, to judge his people. 
and the next verse, or in verse 29, um, happy art thou, O Israel, um, thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, thou shalt tread upon their high places. And I believe that's so wonderfully applicable today. The world's media is so against Israel, tells lies about what happens there. BBC, one of the chief among them. And one day it will be made clear to the world that Israel are God's people. This is God's land. God has put them there. And they will be forced to confess that they were wrong about Israel. They were liars. So that's the Deuteronomy reference. The second one is Psalm, just turn to Psalm 68 and verse 17. Now, in the authorised version in Psalm 68 and verse 17, there's an awful lot of italicised words. So what I've put up there is knocking out all the italics. The chariots of God, 20,000, thousands of angels, the Lord among them, Sinai into the holy. Now, this was a psalm that was written by David to commemorate the bringing up of the ark to Jerusalem. And so very appropriate as an antitype of the antitypical ark, Christ and the bride, coming up to Jerusalem. Now, the RSV puts from Sinai into the holy place. Now, at the Exodus, they didn't go from Sinai into the holy place to Jerusalem. And interestingly, the authorised translation, thousands of angels, is a very poor translation. This isn't the word for angels at all. It's changed ones. So how appropriate for the saints who are now in immortality, 20,000, thousands of changed ones, the Lord among them, and they're going from Sinai into the holy. So uh, again, another testimony that Sinai is the place from where they go and therefore will be the place where they are judged. And the next verse says, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast left captivity captive, thou hast given gifts for men. Um, Hebrew, gifts in the man. And this is quoted in Ephesians chapter four of the Lord Jesus. So again, it's indicating this is something pointing forward. It's the work of the Lord Jesus. He has led captivity captive. For a multitude, he has brought life, abolished death, taken death captive, and given the wonderful gift of divine nature. And the psalm continues, we won't look at it, but it looks of Israel's future salvation and their return to the land. So again, the setting is of a future event, not looking back to the past, but to the future. And then the third reference is Habakkuk, if we can find Habakkuk, one of those that easily gets lost, but I've put a marker in the space there. So Habakkuk 3 talks about God coming from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, Paran is linked with Sinai in Deuteronomy chapter 33. Uh, so he comes, uh, his glory covers the heavens, the earth is full of his praise, his brightness was as the light, he had horns coming out of his hands, that's a symbol of power, and there was a hiding of his power because he comes up in secret as it were. Before him went the pestilence, burning coals went at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. The everlasting mountains were scattered. Perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Now, again, that wasn't applicable uh, to Sinai, but very applicable as the nations are dealt with in judgment when Christ comes up to save his people and uses his power to save his people. So Timan is um, between the top of the Gulf of Aqaba and the bottom of the Dead Sea. It, it's near to Bosra. So that's part of coming up from Sinai through Bosra, Timan, 
and on to Jerusalem. So I hope that's established is that Sinai is the place for the judgment seat. So who are those responsible for judgment? Well, it's those who understand the gospel message. And Brother Roberts has these two lovely little quotes. Responsibility Godward only created by contact with divine law in a tangible, unauthorised form. So those who are responsible are those who come in contact with the word of God, have heard the gospel message. Another quote from True Principles and Uncertain Details, that men are responsible to the resurrection of condemnation who refuse subjection to the will of God when their circumstances are such as to leave them no excuse for their refusal. So he's saying those that have heard the gospel and have the opportunity to accept it, but have chosen not to, they will be responsible to judgment. Now, that then clearly excludes children and those lacking mental abilities to go to the judgment seat. And Brother Thomas in Anastasis says, uh, the light shining into the darkness and divinely attested makes sinners accountable and saints responsible. Uh, sinners accountable for judgment and sinners responsible for judgment. So those who have accepted the gospel message uh, will be gathered and those who know the gospel message and have chosen to reject it they will be gathered to show them the folly of their actions. And I believe it include, will include people and leaders in the day of Jesus. There are just three references. Let's just take the middle one, um, John chapter 12. John in chapter 12. And verses 44 to uh, 50 is uh, Jesus and in opposition to the Pharisees um, and he cries out um, in verse 44, he that believeth on me believeth not on me but him that sent me, he that seeth me seeth not me but him that sent me, I'm the light that's come into the world. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the last day is referring to the day of judgment. So um, there will be those in Jesus' day who heard the gospel message turn their backs. Many we know uh, on the day of Pentecost did repent and accepted, but uh, there will be judgment for those who disobey and don't come. Again, a lot of the Jews in Old Testament times, well, uh, and throughout the uh, uh, last two millennia, um, Brother Thomas, uh, Brother Robert, sorry, and Chris Messiah says, well, I think they're wise words. The national suffering of the Jews in dispersion and privation are evidently a full discharge of the responsibility arising from national election. So he's saying, well, the Jews have received their punishments, uh, that they won't be raised to judgment. Uh, God has seen to it, judgment has already come upon them. So where will the dead be raised for judgment? Well, one would think, well, where they were buried, but well, many of them were burned or eaten alive or wild animals in the arenas of Rome. Some were buried at sea and uh, most are long gone, turned into dust. Um, uh, and so I'm going to propose that because at death for each one of us, God stores our DNA 
um, and their memories that God can raise from any dust their bodies. And so I believe it will be appropriate for the vast majority, I'm not saying for all, but for those who have been long dead to be raised from dust at Sinai. And that would avoid long dead saints born and lived in a world so alien from ours with aeroplanes and motor cars and all the 21st century to avoid all having to face that. But it's merely a system. I haven't any uh, scriptural evidences I can put there. But for the living, well, if we're in John, uh, if we just go back to chapter 11, the occasion of the raising of Lazarus, in verse 28, we have uh, Mary calling her uh, sister, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Martha calling her sister Mary, saying, the master is come and calleth for thee, and she arises and goes to him. Now, again, I am just making suggestions. I'll be very interested to hear your comments. But if a recently dead brother or sister that we've recently put into the grave suddenly came to the meeting room, if meetings have recommenced or to our homes, we would know beyond a shadow of doubt that the master had come. And going to the master is not going to be optional. We have to go. So how do we get there? Well, um, there's a lovely passage in Isaiah chapter 26. It says, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And again, I'm going to make a suggestion that the saints are going to be called away from the judgments that God is pouring out upon the earth. If we go back to the time of the Exodus and the plagues upon Egypt, 10 plagues, the nation of Israel suffered the first three plagues, but they didn't suffer the last seven plagues, only they were felt by Egypt. And I believe that what is happening here is a pointing forward to what is going to happen. Now, COVID might be the first global plague that God has poured out, in which case there's got to be another two plagues that we can expect to see, global catastrophes, financial, whatever they're going to be, we don't know, but terrible things have got to affect the world. Uh, and then I believe the saints are going to be called away um, so that we don't face the more and more and more plagues which are going to be sent until the earth is reeling under the judgments that God is sending. And so we have to be gathered. But how we get to Sinai, we don't know. Will it be like Philip, the caught up by the spirit and we're there? Or will it be by natural means? Because by the time of the third outpouring of plagues upon the earth, People won't be very worried what's happening to all these Christadelphians who are disappearing. Uh, maybe by natural means we are taken there. We don't know. It doesn't matter. It lies in God's hands. What is important is um, how will we be judged? So we ask, who will be the judge? Will we have to go? Uh, and what is the basis for judgment? Well, we know very clearly that the judge is the Lord Jesus. As Paul um, said that uh, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which ordained of God to be judge of quick and dead. I think that was Peter, wasn't it? Um, and Romans, Paul in Romans, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So the ultimate uh, judge is going to be the Lord Jesus. And in Corinthians makes it clear we must all appear, there's no exception, before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he had done, whether good or bad. And uh, Romans 14, again, you know, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone shall give an account of himself to God. Interesting word, that's account. It's the word logos. Um, Bine says an account to account. Um, one gives by word of mouth. There, very interestingly, an answer or expl explanation in reference to judgment to give or render an account. So it sets it in the, a court scene, giving an account. And Peter says, who shall give account, picks up that word to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So is judgment optional? No, it is not optional. And it's not just for the accepted. Um, there is a bit of misunderstanding uh, about this phrase, one shall be taken and one left used in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke chapter 17, but that's something applying to AD 70 and being taken actually means to be received near and to be left is to be actually sent away. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, not applying, all have to go good and bad to the judgment seat and Romans and Daniel. Make it clear, both classes are judged. So what is the basis of judgment? Well, turn to that reading that we took in Ezekiel chapter 33. And so it is an accumulation of pluses and minuses on the balance, as it were. And if it's plus, more pluses than accepted, more minuses than rejected. Well, that's not what scripture says. And wonderfully, Ezekiel, who tells us of the kingdom age, the temple and all that, in three passages, gives us the basis of God's coming judgment. So we just look at very briefly at chapter 33. What all these three passages, and well, reading them at your leisure, what is saying it is we will be judged on where we are at the end of our journey. And uh, Verse uh, 10 of the chapter in the authorised version, I think the ESV made it a bit crisper, but I've got the revised version. Truly, our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we pine away for them. We are sinners, we are worthy of death. How then shall we live? Well, there is a way of escape from sin and death. And what he goes through, and no need to go in detail because we can remember it, I'm sure. But what he's saying is that if the sinner repents, then he will live. If the righteous man turns away from his righteousness and sins, then he will die. Uh, and that simple explanation, it is where we are when the Lord Jesus comes back. Are we for Christ or have we walked away from him? of the cares of this world overtaken us. And that will be the basis of our judgment, not only of our judgment, but of the judgments of the nations. You see, when we come to um, Matthew chapter 25, he gives us three parables. The first, the 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish. The wise had made preparation. They knew that they had to illuminate the Lord when he returned and escort him to the wedding feast. And they made adequate preparation. Though they fell asleep, they had got oil there, so they would have night. The foolish hadn't made preparation. They had spent their time in looking after themselves, unlike the wise. And the second parable reinforces that, the one of the talents, that we have to make every use of the talents that God has given us, not for our own benefit, but for the Lord's benefit. And then the third parable, which it says clearly is judgment on the nations. The nations will too be judged on how they have treated Israel. 
And that's why it's so fascinating, just as we're on the eve of the coming of the Lord Jesus, we're seeing this great change among the Arab nations, that those nations which are going to be blessed in the kingdom age are turning from years and years of hostility from Israel, are turning from their wicked ways, and are now beginning to bless Israel so that God can invite them into the kingdom. And, is, and Europe is increasingly getting hostile to Israel. And we know that God's judgments will be poured upon them. So it's not a matter of an instant. It's a matter of life and death. So I believe that the judgment seat can take several years. There's a lot to be sorted out. Uh, and beyond the uh, acceptance and rejection for those who are accepted, I, I believe that there will be a period of adjustment. If, if we, I draw the parallel with engagement when two couples seek to unite as it were in one and they have to get to know each other and there's an awful lot to be sorted out before the actual marriage and so I believe within this 10-year period prior to the saints being immortalized and going forth to save will not be only just be the resurrection from the dead but the standing before the judge and sorting out matters, and then a period of adjustment, and then immortalization, and then some work to be done before going to save Israel. These are events that have to happen. So what happens to the rejected? Well, those that have been raised from the dead will presumably return to the dust. Those that are alive at the return of the Lord Jesus may be sent back to their own countries, to testify that the Lord Jesus is back and coming and they will perish when God's troubles and judgments are poured out upon the earth. For the rejected, there is shame and contempt. And as Paul says, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that doth evil. So brothers and sisters, let us think about these things. We don't want to be in that category, do we? And in the mercy of God, because we believe we're going to be judged not on what we've done in the past, but how we are now when the Lord comes, that gives us hope. We can repent, we can change. And so for those who are accepted, there is that final stage of anastasis, that change to immortality, something which is beyond our comprehension, something beyond our dreams, but that's the, what God has promised for those that love and fear him. And then the saints can be brought into the knowledge of what is going to happen. You see, the Apostle Paul in, in got to Revelation chapter 10, the revealing of the seven thunders, which is all the detail of how the kingdom is going to be established. He was about to write them all down, but the angel said, no, don't write them down. That's for the future. And so this will be the occasion when immortalized John will be able to say, well, this is what I was going to write. This is the plan of campaign that we're going to follow to establish the kingdom of God. And in addition to that, there is an Elijah work um, of preparation uh, for the Jews and the Arabs for the return of the Lord Jesus. Now, finally, on this matter, what about our young people? Well, if I'm correct in seeing a 10 year period between the return to the household and the going forth to save Israel, then even if a child is born at Sinai at the judgment seat, there will be nine or so before the saints go forth uh, into warfare. And I believe, just as at the Exodus, God will take care of the young people. Angelic hands will care for them until the time after Armageddon when Israel is established as God's blessed people in the land. Then I believe that they will be adopted into an Israelitish family, have the privilege of living at the centre of the kingdom and having their opportunity during their mortal lifetime of an immortality at the end of the millennium when there shall be the second resurrection. 
So uh, let's, uh, time is uh, going on, but let, let's just turn to, if we're in Ezekiel, let's just turn on to that reference there uh, and look at the others that we measure. But uh, Ezekiel 47 and verses 22 and 23 speaks of this kingdom age time when it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by the land by lot unto you and to the strangers that sodden among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have their inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall he give him his inheritance, saith the Lord Yahweh. So I believe that not only our children, but others like the mixed multitude that came up in the Exodus, others will want to live in Israel. But I believe our children, uh, young children will be part of these adopted into Israel um, and having their opportunity to uh, have immortality like their parents uh, at the end of the millennium. Well, just very briefly, I, I moved this from the second part to the first part. Um, perhaps I shouldn't have done, but um, just bear with me. Uh, I just want to very briefly encapsulate this Elijah work, which Malachi speaks of. I might want to turn to Malachi. It's the last book in uh, our Bible. It's not the last book in the Hebrew Bible, of course. But uh, Malachi ends with this picture of an Elijah work, lest uh, Israel's heart, Israel, be um, consumed. And it involves the law of Moses. And I believe that this work of Elijah is to take them back to their Mosaic roots. Um, perhaps we should read it first. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, the statutes and judgments. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. He, Elijah, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So, the interesting thing is that it says, remember the law of Moses. That's what Elijah was skilled in. And his coming back is to be sent to a remnant in Israel to take them back to their Mosaic roots. Um, and that's going to happen before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's the Battle of Armageddon. Same word that's used in Malachi chapter 3 of John coming before the appearance of Jesus. And the word dreadful there, the same word as Joel chapter 2, which speaks of this time, same time period. And what Elijah's work to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, we go back to Mount Carmel. On Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed, hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Yahweh Elohim. And thou hast turned their heart back again. And that's what Elijah did. He turned their heart, set up the schools of the prophets. And that's what Elijah has got to come back and do, prepare the people for the Messiah that would come. And who are the fathers? Well, Abraham. Would the average Israeli today recognise Abraham? No. Would Abraham recognise the average Israeli of today as his children? No, they do not walk in faith. So this is a work that's got to be done beforehand um, to prepare a remnant in order that they might be um, prepared and changed and ready to accept the Lord Jesus. And I believe this work fits in in this time period between Christ's return and the Gogian invasion. And he'll be sent to the Jews living in Israel. Now, on the, what the world calls West Bank, Judea and Samaria, uh, are many settlements. I'll just go to the larger map. The, the darker shaded areas are lands which are under the Oslo Accords, are under Palestinian control. But all the lighter areas are under Israeli control. And you can see that's quite a lot and little tongues coming into the uh, areas of A and B, the C area, the Israeli area. And in the C area, this is where so many settlements have been set up. 
And these settlements mainly are religious Zionists who are looking for Messiah to come. They study the Bible, they teach their children the Bible. And these will be fertile ground for Elijah to take them back to the law of Moses, get rid of all the um, rabbinical sayings and all the clutter that they're associated, get them back to really understanding the law of Moses. And the events that unfold will then bring them to the Lord Jesus, just as I did in New Testament times. Um, it was based upon Israel's understanding the law of Moses, that the Messiah was the Lord Jesus. And the events that will unfold will show that to them. And parallel to that, as I've already hinted, is this secondary work of not only uh, working, preparing uh, Israel, but preparing the Arab nations who are beginning to turn to Israel. And the Abraham Accords are this process whereby God's Abraham's other children are going to be acceptable to God, are going to have a prominent place in the kingdom. Um, not all of them are descended from Abraham, but they will be accounted just as we aren't children of Abraham, but through baptism can be accounted. So Arab nations, uh, even if they're not descended from Abraham, if they're favorable to Israel, will be accounted worthy of a place in the kingdom. And Abraham himself could be take part in that work. We think of, you know, in the past Old Testament times, immortal angels worked incognito Old Testament times, so it can happen again uh, as they work. And so here we come to an end. Um, there is a logical sequence of the resurrection, call for the saints to judgment, larger work, then Israel is invaded, then Christ and the saints come to save the Jews, Battle of Armageddon, Israel saved, war takes place on the Gentiles. Uh, and so uh, there is a logic and a pattern. So uh, if you want copies of the slides, that's my um, website there. Thank you. <laughs>